Okay, we have a red light that seems to indicate that we've started recording, so let me go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, welcome back to 142, uh, the uh, sixth lecture of the quarter. Um, reminder that I posted homework two on Wednesday. I wanted to remind you about how things work, which is that um, I will always finish the material you need for a homework when I hand it out to you. Oh, put it posted on the web page. So um, on Wednesday, that was all that you need to know through chapter two. So we're gonna begin matu new material today, but just to be clear, this is not for homework two. The new material is for homework three. So don't be confused about that. I know it's always a little strange is that then we're moving into new material and you haven't had a chance yet to catch up and do the homework, uh, but kind of, uh, I wanna remind you to, that that's how things work. Okay, uh, our question of the day last time was, uh, at what speed do you watch the Panopto lecture? Uh, and it looks like 40% of you, 41% uh, watch it uh, at the regular speed, uh, but popular choices for one and a quarter and one and a half times speed. Uh, so those were, those, that was uh, your set of answers uh, uh, from the, for, for that particular question. All right, well, let me switch over to Jay Grasp. Um, I wanted to remind you that Wednesday's lecture, this mirror program that we did in Wednesday's lecture is the guide to follow in knowing how to do the homework. So if you haven't watched that Wednesday lecture, it's very important, kind of the steps that I go through describing how it works, the table technique, multiplier and constant, you know, particularly the last 10 minutes where I talk about how to do the constant, how to make the constant work. So anyway, Wednesday's lecture, uh, very important uh, in terms of giving you a model for what to do in your homework. So this is uh, something I posted in Wednesday's calendar entry, which is kind of the final version we ended up with for the mirror program that had a class constant for the size. So let me just kind of point out a few things about it. So we had the draw line method. You remember uh, at the very end in those last 10 minutes, I was changing, uh, coming up with an expression that would allow me to figure out how many equal signs to print. And we had to use the size parameter, or excuse the size uh, constant here in order to change how many lines were being produced. And we had to figure out how to adapt this expression so that it did the right thing. At the very end, I mentioned that in order to do the bottom half, that basically you can do the same lines of code, but in reverse order. So this was kind of the loop going in forwards order. And so all that I did kind of to complete the program was to make a version of that for loop that went backwards, you know, so otherwise the, the, code, the lines of code are the same. Um, that's simpler than your programming assignment. So you're not gonna be able to do that same trick in your programming assignment, uh, but that worked for the program that we did on Wednesday. So I wanted to talk about something that we didn't have time to cover, uh, and it, it's, it's an important thing to understand, uh, it's included in the slides for Wednesday, it's in chapter two, but uh, it's really becoming much more relevant uh, as we move into chapter three. So I wanted to talk about that idea today. So this was our code for the draw top half method. Let me scooch this down a bit so we can see a little bit more of this code. So uh, it's, this is one of those lectures where it's really sad not to have an audience because it's great to have uh, people in the audience looking at this and trying to point out you know, are there some issues here that we'd wanna think about? So in homework one, what we said to you was that we don't want you to have any redundancy. So if we can find two or more lines of code where you have exactly the same lines of code uh, in the program and you didn't turn that into a method, then that's something that we would take off points for. So we really, really wanted you to focus on redundancy in homework one. So is there any redundancy here? You know, that's the question. Uh, and take a look, look at this loop right here that does spaces. Um, it's exactly the same as the loop that does spaces right here. Those three lines of code there are exactly the same uh, within this method, and it's even worse. Those lines of code appear here as well in the bottom half method, and they appear here as well in the bottom half method because I had done a copy and a paste of that. You know, one of the rules of thumb to understand about programming is that if you find yourself doing a copy paste of a lot of code, you should wonder whether maybe there's an error there, you know, a style error. Isn't there a better way to do things? Well, uh, 
That's an interesting question here. Let me go ahead and select these lines of code and I'm gonna make a copy of them. So what we told you to do in chapter one is to make methods. Public static void method. Suppose we called it draw spaces. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of uh, capture those lines of code that are redundant. So I'll include the lines here. Uh, the indentation is off because it's indented too far. So uh, I mentioned that you can select lines of code in JGRASP and use tab to move the one way, uh, shift tab to move the other way. So I'm gonna hold down the shift key and hit tab to kind of space it back so that it's correctly spaced. So suppose we made a method out of it. You know, that would be a way, that would be a good idea, right? You know, then we could have the four calls on this method instead of the four occurrences of that code. Well, let's see what happens when we try compiling it. The compiler's not happy with this. And the compiler says it cannot find a certain symbol, the variable line. Pay attention to where this little up arrow is pointing because the compiler, remember, reads your program from beginning to end and uh, it shows you where it first got confused. So it's pointing right here at this line, you know, the variable line there, and it's saying, I don't know what line is. That's its complaint. So this is an important thing to understand what's going on here. And in order to understand this, there's a concept we have to talk about, which is known as scope. The scope of a variable's declaration. You know, where is the variable uh, uh, visible? Where can you access the variable? Uh, I've mentioned that uh, I don't use slides as, uh, all that much in my lecture, but I've been posting them. And in Wednesday's slide deck, there are some slides, ooh, that's not what I wanted. There's some slides about scope. So here's uh, one of those slides from the Wednesday slide deck. Scope, the part of a program where a variable exists, from its declaration to the end of the curly braces. So for any given variable, so like this variable int x equals three, you find the curly braces that contain it. Kind of what's the, what's the most local curly braces that x that this integer x declaration is inside of. And it's the curly braces for the method from here to here. And so what, what this says is that uh, a variable uh, like this, like x, uh, uh, is declared from the point that the declaration is here to the right curly brace that closes that, that containing set of curly braces. So this is showing you kind of that x's scope is this entire little method. And what we're doing here is we're creating what is known as a local variable. So uh, that's the idea, is that we have a variable that is local to this particular uh, method here. Now, it also mentions that for loop variables are even more constrained for their scope that it's just within the for loop itself. I mentioned this briefly, and we saw it when we were doing this in JGRASP. We, when we uh, kind of stepped through a for loop, as soon as we exited the for loop, the variable was gone. So that's kind of the right way of understanding it, is that something like this int i that's declared for the for loop, it exists only inside the for loop and nowhere else. It goes away once the for loop goes away. This variable x exists you know, uh, within the method here, and it goes away uh, when the method goes away. But it's more than just kind of the, the timing of it, it's also kind of the geography of it, the, the, the where you can use the variable. So here's a variable called line that we declared uh, in, this, in this method. And so what's its scope? Its scope is this for loop right here that is the you know, for loop that's manipulating line. So this is where I can see this variable called line and not outside of it, not outside of that scope. In particular, I can't see it here. So that's the error that it's giving us, is it's saying that I don't see this variable called line. Um, you might think that you could say int line here. You know, you could kind of declare your own variable called line. You can do that, and that kind of gets rid of the error message, but it defeats the purpose. It doesn't help, because this variable called line would be a different variable called line than the one that you'd be creating over there. You can have variables called line in many different methods. You know, so you can have a local variable called line over in this method, another one over in this one, another one over in this one. So you're allowed to have these local variables wherever you want. 
In fact, we saw that. Uh, no one, <laughs> I was gonna say no one asked the question. I guess I know why no one asked the question. No one was here to ask a question. But we had this integer variable spaces here and we introduced the integer variable spaces again. And we've talked about the fact you're not supposed to say that in spaces more than once. But the reason that we're doing that is that these are different int spaces, you know, each with its own little scope. The first for loop has its own variable called spaces. The second for loop has its own little variable called spaces. So this just would not be an approach that would work. Uh, so normally I ask, you know, does anybody have suggestions? And um, maybe an interesting thing to point out is that it didn't give me an error message about size in this method. Uh, and there's a reason for that. This constant size is declared here uh, in the class. And so what's the scope of size? What's the scope of that constant size? Well, what are the curly braces that contain it? It's the curly braces are the curly braces of the class. So this is visible throughout the entire class, this constant called size. And so people kind of wonder, could we make a class, uh, can, can, you know, can line be a class constant? Um, that would make it visible, you know that it throughout. The problem is that we don't want line to be a constant. We want it to be line one, line two, line three, line four. So kind of a constant that changes, uh, which is kind of like a variable. So, you know, uh, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it a class constant, even though that would make it visible. And you might wonder to yourself then, um, is there some way to have a variable that I could have here that would be visible throughout, uh, uh, a, a variable visible everywhere, you know, kind of the, you know, its scope is the full scope of the class. That's something that we would describe as being a global variable. Uh, and let me just say that global variables at this point uh, in time, we consider to be a grievous error, you know, a grievous sin. Um, if some of you may know how to do a global variable, how to declare a global variable. If you don't know, that's good because you won't be tempted. You know, if you do know, then know that you shouldn't do it. You know, there would be a significant style deduction if you were to introduce a global variable. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, why in a, in a minute. Um, it's, it's not so much that a global variable is always a bad idea. You know, we'll get to the point where we will see, you know, the idea of having variables that, that are, are declared globally, uh, but just not yet. We want to be practicing uh, working without it. It's kind of like if you came across your eight-year-old watching porn or something, you'd be like, hey, come on, not yet, not yet. That's not a good thing to be. You know, it's better, better uh, if people do that later in their life. Let, you know, so you're early in your career, wait. You know, we'll, we'll have time to do the global variable later. Um, I said that it's kind of, it's not, it's not always bad. There's kind of an issue here of, you know, there's, there's a classic engineering trade-off that's going on here. And so we're making a choice between different possibilities. You know, the, the, there's redundancy here, so that's an issue. You know, we have some redundancy, and we don't like redundancy, so that's, that's a negative, you know. But the idea is that there may be something more important that we are uh, coming up with, that we're producing. And so I wanted to talk about an idea that I'll, I'll repeat in future lectures, the idea of a component uh, versus an all-in-one uh, system. You know, so kind of a system that's been designed uh, as being a, a collection of independent components that you put together versus a system where it's just kind of all done for you. And so uh, there's an interesting example for this. Uh, I remember that uh, my uh, mother always struggles with, you know, if you give her a DVD player and you gave her a TV, getting everything hooked up so that it worked right, uh, it was just, that was just a pain. So that's the all-in-one, I mean, excuse me, that's the component system where you kind of have a separate television component from a separate DVD component, but now you have to figure out how to, how to connect them. Well, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting option that I'm surprised is still available. I checked on Amazon earlier today that there are TV-DVD combinations an all-in-one type thing. So look, look at that. It's a television that has the DVD player built in. 
nothing to connect, no components to figure out how to put together. It just works automatically. You don't need two separate things. You've got one thing. Um, the, you know, the, there's benefits to this. There's a simplicity to this. That's a good thing. You don't have to worry about kind of the connections and everything. But there's downsides to it, too. I mean, what if you wanted a bigger TV? What if you wanted a different kind of TV? What if that DVD player doesn't handle Blu-rays and you wanted to do that? You know, that you can't replace the television separately from replacing the DVD players because they've been combined. Uh, I thought in uh, kind of a fun other example of component versus all in one is clothing. So normally we think of clothing in a component way. There's kind of a clothing for the upper part of my body, you know, clothing for the lower part of my body, you know, way down here I have, you know, clothing that goes on my feet, you know, but there is this uh, all in one, you know, I, I accidentally showed this before, but it's called a onesie. You can have a onesie, this is kind of the whole family uh, can have a onesie if they want to, where, you know, it's all, it's just one thing, you know, all, all an all-in-one system. Um, I, I used to, uh, uh, once I did this, I, I kind of got such strange reactions that I decided I probably shouldn't keep doing it, but once when I was lecturing at Stanford, I went out and bought one of these, you know, onesies for, you know, a uh, toddler, and I brought it in with a set of a pair of scissors. And I tried to convert the onesie into a component system. So like I, I cut it at the waistline to kind of see that if I could have shirts and pants, and that didn't work. There was only one zipper, and so, you know, and that fell off as soon as I cut the thing in half. So, you know, I, I need to have a fastening approach for the upper part, a fastening approach, uh, approach for the lower part. You know, I tried cutting off the, the feet, you know, on this to make shoes and they wouldn't stay on, you know. So you need like uh, an, a, a plan for how you're going to fasten shoes to somebody's feet as well. So anyway, those are examples of uh, all-in-one versus component systems. So, you know, there's good things about each, and sometimes you might choose a component one, sometimes you might choose an all-in-one. We're going to be more interested in the component approach. So we're more interested in kind of independent components. And if you're trying to make independent components, then local variables are very helpful. Even though they lead to some redundancy, it's a good thing. Uh, I, I wanted to give one other example of uh, uh, where, you know, kind of how you can understand uh, why this local variable approach can be a good approach, uh, why the, the global variable approach can be problematic. And I wanted to do that by talking about uh, refrigerators uh, in dorm rooms. So again, normally I'd ask the whole lecture, you know, raise your hand if you live in a dorm, a bunch of People would be living in the dorms normally. There, there are still a few uh, on campus. I've talked to a few students who are still here living in the dorm. Anyway, you know, a bunch of people normally living in the dorms, and I say, you know, raise your hand if you have a refrigerator in your dorm room, you know, and a whole bunch of people raise their hand. And this is an interesting thing to think about because it's very redundant and it's very wasteful in a lot of ways. Why have all these little refrigerators, one per dorm room? You know, why not have a global shared refrigerator, uh, uh, a dorm fridge, or maybe one per floor, because you don't want to have to go, you know, down to a lower level of the dorm or something like that. But why couldn't you have a shared refrigerator instead of having one per room? And people generally understand why you know, the, the, why we do this? Why do, why, why, why do people do, you know, refrigerators in their own dorm rooms? Um, it's because, like, suppose you had one on your floor that everybody on your floor used, and you went and you put some beer in the fridge, you know, on Monday morning because you were planning for a party that weekend, and you come back, you know, Friday night to get your beer, are you going to find it there in the fridge? And I think there's a high probability that you won't. You might find a note, ha ha, you know, why would you leave your beer uh, unguarded in a fridge like that? So one of the reasons that we do this, one of the reasons we have our own refrigerator is uh, for security. It's kind of, you know, to, to make sure that, the, that we don't have interference, that we don't have others who are going to screw up our refrigerator. So if it's our refrigerator, we know that nobody else is going to have access to it. So that's another reason to want to do local variables. So anyway, there's various you know, engineering reasons here. There are trade-offs. Yes, there's some redundancy, but we think the redundancy is worth it. 
All right, I'm gonna to switch to uh, talking about something more formally for what we're gonna do for today's lecture, for moving into material from chapter three. But let me try to make a very clear statement about something, because I know you all worry about this and you wanna be sure you understand it. Let me try to mention the idea here that is related to your homework too. So this is when you're working on the rocket ship. You may find yourself with a for loop that looks like this and a for loop that looks like this and you can't get rid of it because you can't make a method like I just showed because it is different on different lines. That kind of redundancy is okay in homework two. So you're not expected to get rid of that kind of redundancy. We need chapter three in order to be able to get rid of that kind of redundancy or the global variable, which would be the grievous sin. So uh, you are not expected to get rid of that kind of redundancy. In the assignment write-up, I referred to it as within line redundancy. So you're supposed to be thinking about multiple lines. You know, if these lines here are repeated down here, you're supposed to think about that redundancy. But I mentioned in the write-up that if there's something on the left-hand side of the figure and something on the right-hand side, like these spaces that come at the beginning and spaces that come at the end, it's okay to have some redundancy there. We're not expecting you to get rid of that redundancy. Okay, normally I'd say if there's any questions, but I can't do that. So let me switch to a different program. So now we're gonna be moving into material from chapter three. Again, don't use this for homework two. This is gonna be for our new homework. So this one has various method calls in main. Draw a line that's 13 wide, or a line that's seven wide, 35. Draw a, bo a 10 by five box, a five by six box, and then a bunch of methods that do that. And like the line methods have a for loop that does print, 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 print on the current line, and then one print line that completes the line of output, the kind of stuff that we've been looking at. You know, the box methods have a nested loop, a pattern to it, you know, so very much like what we've been looking at. Um, let me go ahead and compile and we'll run this version of it and we'll just see the output. So we'll go ahead and run it and you can see there's uh, lines of, of stars, you know, that are of different lengths and then there's a box here and then there's a box here. So that's kind of the output. Um, and uh, I hope that when you look at this, that this looks highly redundant and we want to think about how can we improve that? How can we kind of uh, get rid of some of this redundancy that we have here. So uh, I want to begin with thinking about these line methods that we have here. So uh, one of the ways that I would think about it, uh, I actually uh, used to do this when I, in the old, ancient olden days when I would use an overhead projector, but you could kind of imagine it mentally. What would happen if you took this method right here, this line of, of 13 method, and you made an overhead out of it. And you did the same thing for this method here, and you did the same thing for the line of 35 method. And you put those three overheads together, and you put it on the overhead, turned on the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, projection so that you could see it. What would you notice? And so if you kind of mentally do that, if you look at this method, this method, and this method, you can see that there's a lot that's the same. Some things that are different. So the names are different. This is line of 13, this is line of seven, this is line of 35. And what else is different? There's not much else that's different. The only other thing that differs between these is the 13 here, the seven that's here, and the 35 that's here. So what we wanna do is to understand how could we write one method to replace them all. You know, kind of one method that would do the work of all three of these. So how could we write a generic line method, you know, that's going to be able to do uh, all three of these different things? So that would mean that I'm going to want to get rid of this method, and I'm going to want to get rid of this method. So I'm trying to kind of squeeze the three methods into one so that I can, I can do this, you know, have one method that I use multiple times. Well, the thing is that you know, there were these different numbers, 13 the first time, you know, uh, and so forth. So I want to be able to use different kinds of numbers. So I need something more generic here. I'm going to call it count. I'm going to just kind of, this made up a name, the, you know, the variable name count. So uh, what I'd like to do is to have my for loop go count times, and I want count to take on different values. So what is it that I'd like to do? Well, kind of in main, 
what I would hope to do is to set count to be 13 and then call the line method. That's kind of what I'd like to do, you know, for that first one. Here, what I'd like to do is I'd like, oops, I don't need three of them. If I, I'd like to kind of set my count to be seven and then call my line method. And here, what I'd like to do is to set my count to be 35 and call my line method. So that's what I have in mind, is that I'd like to call the generic line method because everything else is the same. You know, the only thing that differed there uh, were these uh, specific values that we had you know, for the different counts for the lines. So how do we do that? Well, you know, I could, I could introduce an int count here or something like that. Uh, I could introduce uh, an int count here, you know, but I'm running into this scope issue again. So that kind of, there's this issue of, well, uh, if, I, if I declared count here, then what I would have is a local variable whose scope is the curly braces that contain it, its scope would be main. It would be visible inside a main, but it wouldn't be visible here. Uh, and I could do int count here, uh, but then that would be something that's a local variable that's visible only here. It would be kind of like, if you think about it, if there's a, a dorm room over here that has a refrigerator, you know, dorm room over here that has a refrigerator, you know, if you set your count to be 13, it's like you put something into your refrigerator, it doesn't magically appear in the refrigerator next door. You know, it's not gonna magically appear in this variable called count, because you have a refrigerator and the dorm ne room next door has a refrigerator. So you putting something in your fridge has no effect on the fridge next door. They're independent of each other. So that's kind of the, the right way to be thinking about local variables. So we have to do something better than uh, local variables. Um, oh, by the way, I did, I did forget one thing. Let me, let me mention this one uh, minor detail. I, I'm, I'm sorry to backtrack, but I think it's probably just better to, to address it. Uh, actually, normally I'd get saved by a student asking me a question, which is, uh, why is it okay to do the constant? You know, so I said that the, the global variable is the grievous sin. Why isn't it a grievous sin to have a global constant? Well, the reason that that's okay is that it is a constant. You know, so the, the thing about this is that nobody is able to change size. There's no interference possible. So there's, you know, this isn't the situation with the refrigerators and the dorm rooms, because nobody can change the value of that size anyway. So that's why constants are okay to use in this global way throughout the class, uh, but, the, but the local variables are not. So, uh, I mean, the global variables are not. Okay, so uh, I'm not even going to suggest the global variable idea here. I'm just kind of pointing out uh, why the local variable idea doesn't work. And let me mention that what we're really wrestling he with here is the idea of information flow. That's the issue that we're thinking about here. We're going to see this uh, coming up uh, in the next few homeworks. We're going to be kind of uh, dealing with this issue. And it does turn out to be one of the more uh, challenging issues for people to deal with. The idea of uh, trying to control the flow of information in and out of a method. This is one of the things that, that takes novices uh, a particularly long time to learn. Um, right now what we're trying to figure out is how to get information into a method. That's what we're trying to figure out. How can main over here let the line method know that it wants to use a 13? How does it get that information into the method? And the way that that's done is by using something known as a parameter. And that's the main topic of chapter three, is parameters. That's the main thing we're talking about here. And that's gonna be one of the main new things that you'll be practicing uh, in homework three, the upcoming homework. I my, uh, my guess is that a lot of you probably have in mind what, you know, because you know, you've, you've seen how we use a printlin, for example. When we say system.out.print or system.out.println, we put in parentheses the thing that we want it to print. That thing that goes in the side the parentheses is known as a parameter. So I think a lot of you probably realize that I'm gonna wanna do line and then put the 13 in the parentheses. That's kind of the thing that I wanna do and I wanna put the seven inside of the parentheses, that's what I wanna do here as well, and I wanna put the 
35 inside the parentheses. So I want to set up the line method in such a way that a value goes into the line method. I'm sorry, I hit the mic. Uh, that a value uh, uh, is, is provided that goes into the line method. So how do we do that on the other side? And one of the things that's, that's to keep uh, in mind about this parameters is that there's kind of two sides to this. There's the issue of when you're calling the method and providing a value versus when you're defining the method. So over here in defining the method, I want to use this you know, generic name count. And so I'm going to put count in the header in the parens, you know, just the way it is in the other one. But if I'm going to introduce a variable like this, Java wants me to tell it it's type. So I say int count in the header. And what you're saying when you do that, you're saying that line has a parameter. Uh, sometimes it's also called an argument. So uh, this method is a different kind of method that can only be called by providing it an int. So if up in here, if I tried calling line with the empty parens, this would be an error. That wouldn't even compile. I can't do that anymore. It's not an option anymore. You've got to provide a value, an int value. And so that's what I did here. And so again, there's kind of the two sides. This is where I'm kind of introducing a generic name that I use within the method. While defining the method, I'll refer to it as count. That's kind of the one side of it. That's something that we refer to as the formal parameter. You don't have to worry about the terminology so much, but it's kind of the parameter, the generalized parameter that's used to define the method. And then over here, there's the, what's known as the actual parameter, the value that we're feeding in to make an actual call on the method. And it's different, different times, right? 13 and then seven and then 35. So I make three different calls on the method. So that's a you know, the different kind of parameter is the, the calling version of it versus the defining version of it. And so I feed in an actual parameter uh, uh, to tell it exactly what value of count to use this time. So uh, I can compile this. I mostly just want to compile. Uh, but well, we'll go ahead and run it to make sure that it's still producing the correct kind of output. And it's still producing those three lines. You know? But now it's doing it with a single method rather than doing it with those three repeated methods. Okay, so that's, that's this basic idea, it's a big idea, you know, uh, takes a little while to get used to, the parameter idea. There's going to be some details that come up associated with it. So normally I say, are there any questions? I get some interesting kinds of questions. One of the things that people often ask is, what if you wanted two parameters? So what if there are two or more things that you wanted to pass in? And I think you can see that that's going to kind of come up here. The idea of a 10 by 5 box. So what, what am I doing here in a 10 by 5 box? Um, this is an example that uh, my co-author Marty Stepp made up. And Marty is using a convention that we're going to see uh, in several places in Java. And you know, when you have a two-dimensional thing, the convention is to give the horizontal first and then the vertical. So this is giving the width first and then the height. So 10 wide and 5 high. And so you can see here, this is that box that's 10 wide and 5 high. And then the next occurrence is 5 by 6. So that's 5 wide uh, and 6 high. So uh, that's kind of the understanding of the box. But I think you can see that what we're going to want to do is to say, I want a box that's 10 by 5. Uh, and then here I'm going to want to replace this with something where I say that I want a box that's five by six. So the answer to your question, which you didn't actually ask, but I'll pretend that you asked it, the answer to your question is yes. You can have more than one parameter if you want to. So this was in the call, you know, was that I was supplying specific values here in the call, but let's take then a, a look at the actual code. So I'm gonna want to collapse these into a single method. So we're not gonna need this one. Boy, that's a lot of code. We're not going to need all of that code, which is nice. We're going to want this code. And I'm going to make a note to myself so that I remember that this was the 10 by 5 version, you know, the code that we have here. Because we're going to want to fix it. We're going to want to change the code so that it's, uh, it, it's more generic. 
But so we're going to call it box. We're going to have a more generic name. So now there were two parameters that we wanted to supply, two different values, and the order was the horizontal one first and then the vertical one. So I'm going to call those width and height. So I'm going to supply a width first and then a height second. That order matters. You know, if width is the name that you're giving to the parameter that appears first here inside of parentheses, then whatever's being passed in here is going to be fed into width. You know, so that's a 10 width and a 5 height, a 5 width and a 6 height. Okay, well, let's take a look. Some of this is a little easier than some of the rest. This was had a width of 10, and it began by printing 10 stars on a line. You know, that was a solid line of 10 stars. You know, that's clearly just the width. You know, that's how many stars it's producing. And that, that 10 appears here, too. You know, that's a solid line of stars at the bottom. You know, the way that this box output looks, let me scooch this up so we can see it, is that there's this solid line of 10 stars at the top and a solid line of 10 stars at the bottom. Okay, now what's going on here? Three, where does three come from? Why three? This bit of code right here is uh, printing a star and then some spaces and then a star. It's producing the lines like this. And you'll notice this subfigure does have three of those lines. But why three? Where does three come from? Well, we said that we wanted, this is the 10 by 5 version, we want a height of 5, uh, but we're making a solid line to begin with, kind of separate from this loop. So we have a, you know, a kind of uh, lines of code that do that. We make a solid line that goes at the end, and that's why there's three in between. A height of five, well, you're going to do you know, the top and the bottom solid lines by themselves, so that means that you want height minus two, because you know, you've already done two of the lines you know, outside of the loop. So where this three came from is that it's the five minus two. You know? So two of the lines are being done outside of this loop. So it's height minus two lines. And there's a similar thing going on here. Why eight? Why are there eight spaces that we're printing? Well, you're printing an asterisk, then you're doing spaces, and then you're printing another asterisk. So of the 10 width, two of those characters are the beginning and the end. So and in between then there were eight. You know, there were 10 of, you know, that we wanted total, and we're doing the star at the beginning and the end. So instead of this eight, we would say that that's the width minus two. That's how many uh, spaces we want, because two of the characters are being printed here, a star and a star. Um, I think that I've got that in pretty good shape. Uh, I've changed every, all of the specific numbers. Uh, let me go ahead and compile, uh, and we'll run it, and let's see if we're getting the same output that we had before, and it looks like we are. So that's good. I mean, we're, we've done a, a pretty good job here. Uh, I don't need to call this the 10 by 5 version anymore because now it's the generic version. It's the, instead of being that specific one, uh, which is great. So I've got a generic box method. This is where I pause and I'd say, are you happy with that? Uh, is, this, is this a good method? Is this an okay method? Do you see any redundancy? Now we're in chapter three. So now that we're in, you know, this is gonna be, you know, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about it for the rocket ship, you know, for homework two, but you know, for homework three, we're gonna to wanna to worry about redundancy again. So do you see lines of code here where there are repeated lines of code? And what I hope you would notice is that I had some lines of code here that were used to produce the solid line of stars at the top of the box. And those exact same lines of code appear here to produce the bottom part uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the box. So this would be something that we would want to have in a method. Um, one of the challenges is going to be that we need to know what the width is in order to do this. So we got a scope issue again. It's just like when we tried to do draw spaces that wasn't working out very well. So how are we gonna deal with that? Well, we have to have some parameter passing or something. But take a moment to think about it. So what would this method be like, the one that we end up with? Wouldn't we end up with a method 
that draws a solid line of stars and you can tell it how many stars, you know, the width of the line. Hmm, something that draws a solid line of stars where you tell it how many stars to do. What did we do here? We had a method called line where we gave it a count that told it how many stars to put on the line. And in fact, these lines of code right here, if you look at them, are exactly the same as those repeated lines of code that we have in our box method, but here it's called count and here it's called width. So we already have this method. We don't need to make a new method. We already have a method that makes a solid line. So we can take all of this code that's here and we can replace it with a call on the line method and we need to tell it a count, you know, how many, how many of these things to do. How many stars do we want? We want width stars. And we can do the same thing down here. All of these lines of code can re be replaced with a call on the line method where we say, I want to do width line of stars. You're starting to see how, how this um, information flow can get a little bit tricky. So now, you know, in the main method, we called the box method passing in a 10 to our parameter called width. So within the box method, there's something called width that is being set to 10 in that first call that we made from the box. And then it calls the line method passing in that 10, that width, but line calls it count. So that same value is getting passed into the box method where it's called width, and then it's being passed again into the line method where it's called count. So this is, this is gonna take a while to get used to, kind of understanding the information flow that's going on within a program like this. But you can see, this is a much nicer version. We've got kind of this pretty short, generic uh, box method that we have here, and a pretty short, generic line method that we have here. And now our main, uh, it fills in the parameters, the actual parameters, to tell it specific values to use. Okay, well that was the main example I wanted to go over for parameters, but there's a couple of extra things I want to mention before we're done. One of them is I want to think about a program like this. What if you had a program like this and you wanted to be able to uh, uh, try to get rid of the redundancy here, you know, the Printlin redundancy. They're very similar to each other. You know, there were things like this in the song program, and we told you don't worry about it for song because we didn't want to, you don't want to worry about it just yet. Uh, but parameters are going to be a nice way to do this. So what if you had a public static uh, void method called say hello, uh, and uh, I don't know whether it has something in the parens or not. Oops, uh, let me go ahead and put this here. Uh, let me go ahead and paste in one of these printlins. So, because all three of these are pretty similar. Hello, Zora, how are you? Well, what I'd like to be able to do is instead of using Stuart or Marty or Zora in all of this, I want to have some more generic kind of uh, a way to refer to it. Like, what if I thought of it as your name? Now, obviously it can't be name, you know, because then it's going to just say, hello, name, you know, how are you? I want this to be some kind of variable or something. So we'll do our trick that we've done before that I'll kind of close that string constant and concatenate something called name. And then I'll concatenate a comma and how are you? So three things that I'm going to concatenate together, some leading text, uh, some uh, variable or parameter or whatever called name, and some more text. So three things with the plus signs in between to concatenate them together for the println. So the question is, how do we do that? So obviously we're going to want to use this technique we're talking about. Uh, we need, because this text that we want to use comes from the outside. So instead of having these three lines of, of code here, we're going to want to be able, for example, uh, here to say, say hello to Stuart. You know, or here we want to be able to say, uh, say hello uh, to Marty. So we'd like to be able to supply the text. And we do need to use the quotation marks there because it's literal string constant that we're using. So I want to have name as a parameter here. What would be its type? Its type is string with a capital S. So that's something we're going to start talking about now that we've gotten into chapter three. Uh, 
We're going to be talking not just about simple values like ints and doubles, not just numbers, for example. Strings are something that we call an object. Uh, and all of these string objects are of type string. That's the name of a class with a capital S, string with a capital S. In fact, here, uh, what I can do uh, in the case for the, for the Zora one, I could actually, if I wanted to, set up a string variable in main. I can set up a string S that I set to be Zora. So that's like saying, you know, int x equals three or something like that. I can set up a string variable, and then I can say, say hello, passing in that string variable. Uh, let me compile and run and make sure we get our, our three lines of output here. Uh, there are our three hello statements. So I wanted to show that example. Uh, string is a type. It can be used to declare var local variables like that, and it can be used to declare parameters. You know, so both of those things are true. Um, I wanted to briefly mention a parameter mystery problem. So normally you'd be having to worry about this because I tell you that it's on the midterm and that you're going to have to do this. So you could say, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to know how to do these. Let me just tell you, my advice is, you know, I, I think it's more important than just that it was on the midterm. I think that this is really useful. I think that practicing these things, it was like with expressions last Friday when I mentioned that I think practicing them is really helpful. I do think you learn something important by practicing parameter mystery. So what's going on here? I have a, a method here that has some parameters called x uh, and, and z and y. And then I have variables here called x and y and z. So this is the case where I'm jumbling it up on purpose, where there's x, y, z over here in main, and there's x, y, z over here in the method, and they're different. That's like two rooms, each with their own refrigerator. You know, so there's an XYZ that's local over here and an XYZ that's local over here. And so what we do is we kind of mix them up on a call and we ask you to tell us what output is produced by this call. Let me just mention briefly, you know, uh, the TAs will probably spend a little time on this, not as much as we normally do, but they'll probably spend a little time uh, in section next week. Let me just kind of mention an idea of what I tend to do with something like this. I, I look, I do it as a two-step process. First, I look at the method, and I look at the header. What's being declared here? An X and a Z and a Y. An X and a Z and a Y. That's in the, the method header. You know, that's kind of an important thing to understand. Then, and those, so basically I'm gonna make a table, you know, X and Z and Y. Then I come over here, and I ignore the method header. Now I'm gonna pay attention to the calls. And so over here, there's an X, Y, Z. And what am I passing in? I'm, I'm passing in what's known as Z, what's known as Y, what's known as X. Well, that Z has a value two, that Y has a value nine, and that X has a value five. So I'm passing two, nine, five, two, nine, five into that method on the first call. And on the second call, I'm passing Y, X, Z. I'm passing nine, five, two. 952. Those are the two calls that are made. So that's, you know, and then what I would do is I'd come back over here and I'd kind of, I'd execute the println the two different times. Now I know, and now I'm paying attention to the table headers, you know, what's x and what's z and what's y. Um, let me show it to you. I want to just briefly show you that uh, the um, debugging capabilities of JGRASP are nice for this. So let me recompile. And let me debug. And so what you can do here is you can see there's main with its version of X and Y in Z. And I've gotten to this call on the method. Now, I've been using this little uh, button right here that kind of goes one step forward in the program. If I use that, it would execute the entire mystery method and go to the next line. I don't want to do that. I want to go into the method to kind of see the details of what's going on. So I'm going to click on step into. And when it does that, you're going to see it set up these uh, parameters. It's feeding in the z, y, x into the method. And so when I step into the method, you'll see that there's an x and a z and a y. And it's just like my table is showing here. x and z and y are set to 2 and 9 and 5. So this is a useful thing to pay attention to, is that JGRASP lets you see you kind of what's going on when you go inside of the method. Uh, and in fact, 
you'll notice here that I can even go back to Maine. It remembers that I was in Maine and that it had an X, Y, Z, or I can go into mystery and see what X, Y, and Z are there. Let me uh, end this and I'll just show you that we could go ahead and, and compile and run this. I do think that it's useful for you, it's good practice to be able to produce this kind of output. There's a lot of these practice problems in the book uh, and in practice it, and there'll be some in the section uh, next week as well. I think it's helpful for you to make sure you understand the idea behind the parameters and the fact that these names that I'm using here, the X, Z, Y that I'm using here, are different than the X, Y, Z that I'm using here. Okay, that's what I had for today, so we'll go ahead and wrap up there.